Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's having a great day. Uh, my name is Chad Sanderson, and today we're going to spend some time talking about how to create a sales cadence to drive that top of funnel growth. I know that those of us in sales uh, love prospecting more than anything else in the world, so I appreciate you taking time to uh, to dig into the, some of this with us. I want to thank everybody for joining, and I also want to apologize in advance if there are any technical glitches that would be on me. Of course, we have to do the please follow us, engage with us uh, on all of the platforms that are out there. We want to make sure that uh, we're providing you guys value as we continue to provide content and thought leadership. So please take the time, reach out to us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, you know the drill. So let's start with a question, see as people continue to roll in. Um, I'm going to start a poll here for you. What have you found to be the most effective method of prospecting? So just jump in there and answer those questions for me as soon as it launches. There we go. Depending on who you ask and who you talk to, everybody will tell you maybe they've got a secret, a bullet, a silver bullet for prospecting. If there's one that exists, I haven't found it yet. Um, I love those of you that are being honest, telling me that uh, blind luck <laughs> is part of the prospecting. I'll give it another second here. I'm gonna close this poll and then show you guys the results. Oh, come on now. There we go. All right. So it's interesting when you look at this, that we talk about networking and industry events as the most effective way of prospecting. And it is definitely effective, right? It is definitely a way to have that human to human connection, which is what prospecting really should be all about. And in the challenge is, though, we don't have industry events or big networking events every day of every week. Um, some of us have several a week that we target, but what we need to do, what we really wanna do is come up with an approach that is predictable, repeatable, allows us to better manage the grind of prospecting and be able to do this in a way that allows us to get around the fact that consistently there aren't events for us to go to, but that we can still connect to human beings and have those conversations. So as we begin, let's, take a look first at kind of the top three challenges that we see prospecting suffer or fail. The number one thing that we see is, is perspective, right? So a lot of people that prospect, whether you're an SDR, uh, whether you're doing prospecting from a marketing standpoint, or you're an account exec and you're going after large accounts in an account-based sales approach, oftentimes we see a, a challenge with perspective. Most people that are prospecting have it in their heads, and you see this a lot with SDRs or sales development reps, where they're focused on, I have to get a meeting. And the first thing we have to do is switch our perspective to understand that our goal is information. It's not necessarily just the meeting. We want to make sure that we are getting information because maybe we're prospecting into people who aren't ready to buy or don't have problems that we can solve. The other element of our perspective that we have to switch is that prospecting, while it is a grind and not, I don't know many people that wake up in the morning and go, oh, I can't wait to hit my call block today. Um, but we have to make sure that we're switching perspective to understand it's not about us. It's about the people that we are selling to. We want to understand their problems. We want to understand the things that are going to provide them value. And it isn't about features and functions or services. It's about outcomes that we can produce. So when we switch our perspective and start to think about it in that way, it drives the way that we out, do our outreach, the content that we provide, things of that nature. The second largest challenge that we see is related to that content that we produce. Most content that we see today is around the company that you're prospecting for. Hey, my widget will do X or this service will do Y. What we wanna do is make sure that the content that we produce, and this isn't just marketing content, this is content in the way that you structure your emails or the voicemails that you leave or the way that you engage on the phone or even the way you engage at a networking event. The content is, is, the, is the realization of that change in perspective. So we wanna make sure that we're providing content that's not gonna provide value from our perspective, but it's gonna provide uh, value from the buyer or, or prospect's perspective. This is a huge shift for marketing and sales organizations often. It's also more difficult because you're prospecting to oftentimes multiple industries, maybe different types of buyers and their problems or the things that they're going to find valuable may be a little bit different across the board. So doing this at scale requires a little bit of customization, personalization, and we'll talk about that as we move on. Third is quality of contact. And when we talk about quality of contact, 
This is where you see your, your perspective and your content come together. If we're working only to get an answer to, hey, will you meet with me, comes across as pushy. It's annoying. Uh, it's, it's not what anybody wakes up in the morning and hopes a salesperson will reach out to them and do. What we want to make sure is that the quality of our content allows us to be us, to be authentic, to be true sales professionals, business advisors, so to speak. And we want to make sure that we're collaborating with people, not just pushing stuff at them. So it needs to be tailored. This is where you hear all of the stats these days and conversations around personalization, right? We, people want to know that you know who they are. So the quality of that contact needs to be focused on the people that you're prospecting to, the problems that they care about, the outcomes you can provide that will help them achieve their goals, not necessarily help us just hit quota. Although of course that is the goal. So let's do one more poll. If I can get this kicked off. What is your pros why is your prospecting not more effective today? What I wanna know is if you guys are being really honest with yourselves, what, <laughs> First thing I see is not enough time come up. Low response rates, okay. Interesting, give it a couple minutes here, a couple seconds. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we look at the reasons, the reasons, I'm gonna close this poll here and share the results with you guys. The reason that we see most people not have consistent approach to prospecting um, is is very varied. Low response rates, uh, we can talk about a little bit. We'll talk, it's exactly what cadences are designed to help get around. Uh, not enough time, we all have to focus on a myriad of things in our day, right? Prospecting if you're in sales is where most of the effort happens. So we wanna make sure we're focusing in the right way and we'll talk about some techniques and, and ways that you can do that. Um, <laughs> I love the 5%, no one gives a damn about my product. Um, and at the end of the day, let's be honest, they don't. What they care about are the outcomes that you can provide for them, right? It's not about, it's not about us, it's not about our product, it's about what we can do for the buyer. So how do we do this? How do we do this effectively? How do we make sure our cadences are consistent? I don't know if anybody out there has seen it and I'm not promoting it. There's a movie uh, with Will Smith called Focus. And there is a scene in that movie where he is a, he's a gambler, he's betting with someone and they have spent a great deal of time before the moment of that bet, priming the individual's memory so that he picks a specific outcome. And this is done through uh, subtle suggestion as well as getting in front of someone. There's this concept of, understanding you know the more i see something the more it becomes truth and so when we structure cadences what we want to do is make sure we're structuring those in a way that tweak the curiosity perhaps induce anxiety and then demonstrate influence that we can help them solve these problems or resolve that curiosity or anxiety as well as motivate them to act put them on a timeline so that we can get them in fast enough now that may be a meeting or it may be them just telling us hey I don't have, I'm not in the buying window right now. I don't need this, I don't want this. I'm thinking I'm focused on other things. And so when we construct our cadences, we wanna take into account that psychological reality that people are facing. We're competing with hundreds of impressions a day. I don't know how many emails you guys get in a day, but I'm well over a hundred a day, as well as of course LinkedIn going off and then the latest cat video on Facebook, which I can't miss. So we wanna make sure when we are out there reaching out to these individuals, we're doing it in a way that is professional, that is predictable and consistent, that also allows us to be us. You're gonna hear me say authenticity a lot because nobody wants to buy from a cookie cutter sales rep. They wanna buy from people. And this is where the, the, while artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us automate some of this, it doesn't replace that one-to-one -one connection, that human-to-human -human connection that we're after. So if we can construct the cadences to tap into that, to prime the memory, to create the impression that there is a relationship of value then we have more response rates. We have people respond to us quicker, faster, whether again, and that's to set a meeting where to buy or to tell us, hey, not now. Either way, uh, it's a win because then we have information we can continue to act on. The other thing that we need to do when we're creating cadences is we have to focus. Um, not enough time came up as one of the responses earlier. There is nothing more important in a salesperson's job than prospecting. Uh, it's not talking about the latest Game of Thrones episode, although I'm extremely stoked that it's coming back at the beginning of the year. 
It's not sitting around talking to management, although you have to do that. There are things you have to do on a daily basis, but we have to carve out time so that we can focus. To prospect effectively in the environment we're working in today requires us to get rid of the distractions, really be focused not only on what we're doing and how we're doing it, but who we are doing it towards. Who are the people that we want to connect with? What are their problems? That focus becomes one of the biggest challenges that we see in open air environments or when people are you know, doing it with friends, they have a tendency to distract each other. So we have to own our accountability and responsibility for the focus of our application of best practices in multiple channels. Cadences aren't, hey, I'm gonna call you Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm, all I'm gonna do is call you. What we wanna do is create a cadence we're using multiple channels. Now in value selling parlance, we call this the sphere of engagement. If you think about the channels that you can control, there are one-to-one -one or one-to-many relationships. So you guys had mentioned events and networking. That's a one-to-many. I go to an event, there's a whole bunch of people there. I may target some specific individuals, but it's really a one-to-many type of event. With networking, it's kind of the same thing. Maybe you go to a regular meetup, maybe there's a group of you that share leads, uh, things of that nature, it's still one-to-many. It's not as focused and as personalized in a one-to-one -one relationship, whereas what we see in social, email, and phone. Those are, I'm reaching out to a specific target. Groups are things that you do that you don't normally think about as being work-related. Uh, I'm a Harley rider, I go to motorcycle rallies. It's not something you normally <laughs> attach to you know, B2B enterprise sales, but being aware of what's going on in my surroundings when I'm even outside of my normal work environment provides opportunities or another channel for me to manage as I do my prospecting. You'll notice in the sphere of engagement, we've talked about this before, if you listen to the last podcast I did, this is kind of a heartbeat cadence, right? It creates the vortex, one-to-one, one-to-many, one-to-one, one-to-many. Now the trick or the challenge becomes making sure that we strategically choreograph those outreaches across those channels. We use our focus and our understanding of who we are looking at or who we're prospecting to, to make sure that we are creating the sense of a relationship. So for example, and we'll talk about this in more detail towards the end to see who sticks around long enough, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about this at the end and I'll show you some examples. But what we wanna do is say, hey, if I meet somebody at an event, Maybe two days later, I'm going to follow up with a phone call, not leave a voicemail, but I'm going to send them an email instead. And those, those interactions kind of daisy chain or connect to each other. So I have a phone call. They didn't answer. I'm going to send them an email. Hey, it was great to meet you at this event. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. You want to tell them what you're going to do so that we don't put too much pressure on them to have to, to take action initially. And what we want to do with our cadences is really make sure that we're strategically choreographing that based on where these people are where they get their information from, and how we have the best chances of getting in front of them at the end of the day. The goal, again, is to get to that human-to-human -human connection. So one of the key components of this is mindset. And it is the hardest part because I've been doing cold calling, uh, I don't like that word, but I've been doing this outreach for many, many years and I still do not wake up in the morning and say, oh, hell yeah, I've got a call block in an hour. I can't wait to start dialing the phone. However, if you don't get yourself in the right mindset, it comes through. It comes through in the sentence structure and the word choice you use in emails. It comes through in the way you interact on social platforms. It comes across in your voice. It comes across in the way that you, when you get them on the phone, how you approach them. And there's an old saying, somebody told me once that you get relegated to the level that you sound like. It used to be dress for success, always dress for your next job. Same kind of concept here. We wanna make sure that we are in the mindset to prospect. This is where the focus comes in. If we can't get into the mindset, we still have to do it because it's a grind and you still got a prospect, but we're not gonna be as effective. So some of the things that we see, if somebody's doing a call block, we like to see people standing up. We always say, hey, smile, because it comes through in your voice. And you can really hear the difference, right? So whatever you have to do, number one technique, and this is literally the most important thing that I'm gonna tell you today, figure out a way to get yourself in the zone. If you've played sports, you know what I'm talking about. There's always some ritual that may set it off. For some people, it's listening to a song. For some people, it's working out. For some people, it, it could be like me, going on a 40 minute motorcycle ride. But get in the zone and really control that mindset because that is going to impact everything you do. 
it's going to impact the way that you do your research, which is the critical next critical component of making sure your cadences are effective. We're going to talk a little bit more about best practices for how long you should research. People talk about, I don't have enough time, but in 15 minutes, you can do enough research to power cadences for an entire month. And so we'll talk about that. You have to do the research because people want to know you know them, not just about the industry, not just about the role, not just about their company, but all of it. And we need to do it in a way that we can show it, demonstrate it in a non-pushy, non-hey, I know everything kind of way, but that shows that we're showing them the respect of having done some homework. Because if you guys ever get those templated emails that you can tell are marketing automated and everybody in the list got the same email, they don't, they're not as effective. That, quite frankly, they're annoying. They do work sometimes, you know, hey, even a blind squirrel can find a nut, right? But you're gonna, you're not going to have as many conversions and we wanna increase those response rates. Is that was something you guys had pointed out. Now, we've done our homework, we're in the mindset, right? And what we wanna do is block our time. Time is the one asset we don't get back, right? And everybody has seen or read or heard about how, I think somebody told me Elon Musk breaks his days into five minute increments. I'm not sure I buy that, but time blocking in and of itself, managing your time is something that you should be doing aggressively and on a daily basis. 40% to 50% of a week should be time blocked out for activities that are specifically focused on prospecting or revenue generation. So 40 to 50% of your time each week should be blocked out. And if there's a whole bunch of different time blocks you can use or things you can focus on. But when we do it specifically around prospecting, we wanna make sure we're setting up our time so that we are completely focused on dialing the phone or completely focused on preparing our list. We're completely focused on sending our emails and personalizing those. We're tracking the data, figuring out what works and what doesn't. If we don't put the time on the calendar, if we don't block it out and protect it, something else is going to come along and get and, and come over that and then all of a sudden next thing you know your pipeline does not look like you need it to look and that commission check that you thought you were going to get just gets smaller so time blocking takes practice takes a little time you'll figure out what works for you what works best some people are morning people so they want to do all of their you know high focus prospecting in the morning some are better after lunch figure out what works best for you put those time blocks in there and stick to it now, when we start to do our prospecting, we want to make sure that we're uncovering value from the buyer's perspective. Nothing does this better than asking informed questions. The questions that are informed by our research show that not only have we done our homework, not only are we approaching them in a way that is based on collaboration, but that we also are putting ourselves in a, in a situation where we want to learn from them as well. The time of a sales rep being the only Sherpa that gets somebody through the sales process is past because everybody has access to this thing called the internet and everybody believes everything Google tells you is 100% accurate. So what we wanna do is really approach them in a way that doesn't come across as, hey, I know better than you, but hey, I have access to some specific information combined with what you know and based on my research, I think there might be some connections here, here, and here. What do you think a conversation would be like if we were to spend 15 minutes, right? We want to make sure our questions are really focused on that homework, and that research that we've done with these individuals. Questions create solutions rather than conflict. Statements can, can create conflict. I stole that from another one of our coworkers, by the way, so I can't take credit for that. But it's true. If you think about it, when's the last time you responded well being told what to do or being told that you were wrong? Whereas if you just change the perspective, really strategically choreograph or develop your questions, it leads to a conversation, it leads closer to the solutions. So when we talk about time blocking and we talk about research being important, kind of the best practice that I always, I use this on a regular basis. If I pick an industry, let's just say manufacturing, and for the next two weeks, I'm gonna prospect into manufacturing. I'll spend 15 to 20 minutes researching the industry. This is four or five Google searches right? It's not a lot. I've hit their website. I've obviously looked their website, but I'm going to look at the industry that they're in and see if I can find some timely reports, something that I could share that would be valuable to them, to the individual that I am, I'm focused on. Then as I get down into it, once I get a response from that based on my industry research, I spend 10 minutes on the company. Website, 10Ks if they're public, 
you know, not a lot of research, but enough to understand in the right places how I can inform my questions to make that conversation valuable. And then once you get ready to have the call, 10 minutes on the person. Everybody's got access to everybody's information today, right? LinkedIn, although they're not all out there. I think last stat I saw said 56% of business executives are on LinkedIn. So there's some that you won't find out there depending on your industry. But if you can do this and, and make sure that your approach to prospecting is strategic, you're gonna be much more effective at having the mindset because you, you feel comfortable, you have some information, you have some resources you can share, you understand some of the problems that they may be having, you can combine that with other companies that you've already helped to demonstrate influence, and then 10 minutes on the person and not just, hey, I noticed you went to Ohio State. Like everybody pulls that, right? Like <laughs> do a little bit more homework than, hey, I'm gonna go look and see what school you went to. That may be appropriate if you guys were in the exact same class, but we wanna make sure that we're really showing them that we are invested in understanding them. Doesn't take a lot of time, block out, I block out an hour every two weeks for doing research on the industry and or companies. We wanna make sure that's there because if you don't do that, no matter how well you cultivate your lists, no matter how well you do anything else, you're not gonna be able to create those informed questions. And that's really what we're after. In addition to blocking out time for research, we also wanna block out time to create cadences. When you think about those six channels in the sphere of engagement, it's easy enough to go, okay, hey, today I'm gonna to send an email, tomorrow I'm gonna to do a social interaction, and just do it seat of your pants, right, or off the cuff. But what we really wanna do is if you understand the persona of the person you're going after, then just throwing stuff out there, you know, you have more information. We wanna apply our brain here. Let's think about it. If I'm going after a CMO, CMOs have a tendency to be more socially engaged. So perhaps I wanna start with social interaction with them for reasons, because, for reasons that demonstrate, hey, we know you're involved in this. If I'm selling to, and I can tell you this from experience, manufacturing, those guys aren't, you know, some of those executives are not active on social and even probably still have, I actually have a client does it still have, may have an executive who screens all their emails and prints them out in some cases. So you really wanna make sure you understand who as much as possible, who you're going after and block off the time to think about those cadences, to build those plays, some other call them plays, to build those plays based off of the person and the industry that you're going into. Now, here's the big one. And everybody, everybody kind of moans when this comes up. There is still no more effective way to get in contact with someone than picking up the phone. There are ways that you can amplify that, and that's what the cadences are designed to do. Cadences, the way we create them, are designed to give you a, a multiplier effect on your efforts. But if you're not picking up the phone every day and calling, you are, you are introducing risk into your pipeline that shouldn't be there, doesn't need to be there, right? So call block every day, that's the one thing above all others that I will protect because if I don't start making my calls, I start to, I start to get a little shaky because I can feel my pipeline going out the window. The other thing we want to do is make sure we block time to do email personalization. Just doing personalization when you're distracted by a whole bunch of other things going on, it comes across in the email, right? The less words you can use, the better. Uh, I work with Noah, a gentleman named Ryan Avery who taught us a 25, 15, 10 rule. If you write something with 25 words, go back and try and write it with 15, then go back and try and write it with 10. The more succinct you are, the more impactful you will be, the better answers you will get. Social interactions, same thing. If you're gonna go out and interact, engage on social media, social media is designed to develop a relationship. It's not designed to be a platform for selling, not right off the bat. And if you go out and you like something, okay, that's like minimum effort. You know, it's the sound of a golf clap, right? Really engage, make a comment, show your intellect, demonstrate your, your understanding of their industry and or market. Share with them on social media something they may not be aware of. This is a key to priming that memory of, hey, you might be somebody that should be paid attention to. And then the least favorite after call blocks, of course, is updating the CRM and doing the data analysis. What's working and what's not? We have the tools to help us do this at scale and get much more focus. It requires us to, of course, update the CRM. And the CRM should be your best friend because once you figure out that this company you've been calling into just signed a contract with a competitor, you don't need to call them for the next six months. Call them in nine when they're gonna be back in the buying window or it's coming up close to that. Don't waste your time prospecting where somebody's not gonna buy. 
faster we can figure that out, the more effective you're going to be. The higher your response rates are going to be because you're dealing with people that are trying to solve the problems that you can solve or achieve the outcomes that you can provide. So tech stack, proper preparation. Here's the, here's the piece. Everybody wants a new tool that's going to solve all the problems and the promise of AI and the promise of machine learning. Um, for those of you that are probably not as old as myself, uh, they said the same thing about the internet, being the promise to making sales easier. The end of the day, the technology should be designed to facilitate human connection, not block it, not get in the way. If we can use those tools, you know, on a cadence management tool, there's outreach.io or insightsales.com. There's a host of these cadence management tools that will help automate some of your tracking and what's working and what's not your analytics. I have a tendency, I use some of those tools, but I also still like my pen and paper and spreadsheets because then I don't have digital distractions when I'm making calls. It really makes me focus on thinking about, okay, did this email work? Or did this voicemail script work? Or did this conversation, when I handled this objection this way, how did that go? It really brings me back to that focus element. Tech stack should be there to help you, not hinder, not get in the way. We don't wanna use it as a crutch. List preparation. Number one thing we always hear from every customer that I've worked with is the data. I can't get access to decent data. And we all know the tools that are out there, right? From discover.org to Zoom Info to Rainmaker, you name it. There's a whole bunch of people out there that will provide access to the data. And some people want to go in and just run a search. Hey, I want to, I need a list of CMOs in this size industry that are targeting these types of people who use this technology. And you can get some of that. But the data accuracy is not going to be 100%. And we need to just accept that right now. We're not at a point where I can just go get a list and all of a sudden I have everybody's direct dial number and email. We have to put time in to cleaning our own lists. The sales reps, the, the marketing people, we own that. I'll, even if the company says, hey, I'm going to provide you with a list, great. Provide it with me, to me in enough time that I can go through and cull it, that I can make sure it's as tight as possible. Because you get into the zone of making calls or sending personalizing emails, and then you have one bounce, or you get uh, this person doesn't work here anymore, and it interrupts the flow, right? Now, granted, it's information we need. Remember, we want that information, but we have to own prep in our lists. Yes, it's about as fun as watching paint dry, but it is critical. If we don't do the prep on the list work, then our efforts as we do the grind, as we engage in that multi-channel outreach, it gets hindered. And so we want to avoid that. Take the time, block it out every week, clean your list, update your CRM, keep the data fresh. It will help you get faster as time goes. So when we look at it and we go, okay, I'm doing all of this, but the leads didn't convert. And I hear a lot about, you know, MQL is not converting or, you know, hey, I, they didn't respond to me, right? When we look at the data that's out there, most buyers, most prospects are influenced by people who want to collaborate. And collaboration is probably going to be another one of the next new word, buzzwords like innovation or artificial intelligence. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about is how do I work with someone in conjunction with someone to combine the information and the, and the solutions that I have with their expertise to solve a problem that neither one of us alone could tackle. And that's really the, where collaboration comes in. It comes in through asking those questions. And when I, when, when I do analysis for customers on you know, poor conversions, the vast majority of time, well over 80% of the time, what we see is the way that the prospector, the person doing the prospecting is engaging is by talking about them. It's talking about what, hey, this feature does this. Hey, did you hear about this new feature in Microsoft Word? Open, save, pew, blow your mind. Nobody really cares, right? What they care about is what is it going to do for them? And so we have to make sure we stay focused on that, make sure that we collaborate with them as we go through this entire process. And yes, I keep harping on it because as we give you these tools, we talk about multi-channel cadences, people have a tendency to fall back into the behaviors that they're the most comfortable with, right? And what we want to do is make sure we give you this framework, give you the tools that are going to make it effective, that collaboration is critical. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing that really helps that I have seen supercharged kind of prospecting is oftentimes prospecting is done, I don't want to say in parallel with, but let's say not completely connected to a sales methodology, right? Sales process is about, hey, here's what happens at 10%. Here's what I could do at 20. Here's what I got to do at 30. We talk about methodology. If you have SDRs that are taking an MQL and they're qualifying it, 
and they qualify and hand it to an account exec inside of the same framework, conversion rates go through the roof. But if an SDR isn't using that same framework and hand stuff off, each SDR may hand stuff off in a different way. If you are a uh, account exec doing your own prospecting, sometimes you'll think, hey, I want to try this new silver bullet little trick I heard about online uh, in my call blocks, but it may not be consistent with your sales methodology. You end up creating friction, right? You create friction in the sales process. And that's one thing we can't have. That's customers won't, prospects won't stand for it anymore. So we need that common language. We need that methodology, that framework from beginning to end. Without that, there are these gaps and they will shred your leads like nobody's business. I've seen companies who can get 20, 30, 40 MQLs a month and their conversion rates less than 1%. And that's really low. When you look at why, it's because there are different languages or a different approach being used at each handoff that introduces friction. And we need to, we need to ensure that our sales process is consistent from beginning to end. So that common language internally reflects in the way that we interact with the customers and if we keep <laughs> if we're not being consistent if somebody touch, has first touch or even our marketing collateral creates an expectation that we don't fulfill through the rest of the revenue funnel we end up creating that friction point and and you see the drop offs you see the response rates maybe you get a first response but they don't come back and respond again or they agreed to a meeting but they don't show right oftentimes when we do the analysis we, we see that this is because there isn't a common language or a common approach that's being used across the sales process so we want to make sure we're consistent and we tie in our prospecting the way that we do it what we're focused on the information we need to collect with that longer term sales methodology, make sure we can get them all the way through to close. Now, friends don't let friends prospect alone. If there's anybody out there who's been in one of my classes, I harp on this a lot. There is nothing worse than sitting in a room in a basement, like I am now, and just picking up the phone and dialing, right? If you do your call blocks, if you do your email personalization as a group with friends, you learn from each other, energy stays higher, focus is better when you get rejected it doesn't hurt as much <laughs> because you can share that rejection with others and learn from others we've seen when we run call blocks with clients and we do it the right way we debrief the call block and we hear them say hey you know what that was actually kind of fun which is not a word that anyone i would bet on this webinar would typically associate with prospecting right some people may enjoy it more than others but fun is not a word you typically hear but when you do it with your friends when you do it with your coworkers even if you're not in the same company but you happen to hang out with sales execs uh, that have to do the same thing set up some time get together take over a room somewhere focus on it together learn from each other cross pollinate keep each other excited keep that energy level high keep that mindset engaged and the focus applied right all of those things up to this point are going to help you make sure that when you develop your sales cadences that they are as effective as possible and structured so that they break as quickly as possible yeah i'm gonna take a pause the goal with the sales cadence is actually to break it what we want to do is we want to put together a strategically choreographed series of interactions across each of those channels that we talked about in sphere of engagement to increase the probability of connection to get back to higher response rates and break the cadence. Because the minute somebody engages, the cadence is broken, it served its purpose. Now we're into how do I handle objections? Or how do I overcome uh, a misunderstanding that may be in place? How do I continue the conversation? And then you get more into your sales methodology. If we can construct our cadences strategically based on who we're going after, our research in the industry, our preparation and understanding of questions that will help us collaborate as well as sharing value with them. We want to break them as soon as possible to find out, yes, we should continue going after this person or this account or no, these people are not in a buying window right now. We want to break them as quick as possible. Yes, it takes a lot of focus and energy to create the cadences and it may seem a little counterintuitive that the goal is actually to break it as quickly as possible. But really remember the goal here is to prime the memory, tweak the curiosity, provide value through things that you share or information that you have in order to get a reaction or a connection to find out if it makes sense to continue conversations. So when we look at cadences, you heard me mention earlier that what we wanna do is we wanna provide value at the front end, right? So I'll use an example. I host a podcast 
And when we do some of our prospecting, we reach out to the prospects, we invite them to be a guest because that showcases them. It's valuable for them as an individual, perhaps for their role in the company. If we go after someone else where a new, let's say, I don't know, tariffs just got introduced or something, and that affects a regulatory environment, we may pull a report and say, hey, I know you're in this industry. We have other clients like you that are affected by this, thought this might help inform your thinking. First two interactions, very rarely do I ever ask for anything. That may be counterintuitive to what you hear other places like, hey, just get to the point. But at the end of the day, we have to remember, people buy from people. And if the first thing you do is walk up and ask somebody, hey, you want to go to dinner, it kind of creeps them out, right? The number one thing we see in the data and the reports is they don't want pushy. We want people that are taking the time to understand them. And doing this at scale is where the structuring, the cadence comes into effect. Now, the top part of this slide, it says social interaction one, social interaction two, email. Those can change depending on who you are going after. Like I said, in manufacturing, those first two wouldn't be social. Maybe it's actually printing out a new report, highlighting three or four sentences, putting a sticky note on it and mailing it to somebody. Snail mail has great response rates right now because not many people are using it. Once we've provided them value, they, they bring down their guard a little bit. So then we want to start to provide some insights. This is best through third-party content. Like, hey, we're playing in an industry that we know is impacting your business. Thought you might find this helpful. Thought you might find this interesting. Then what we want to do is provide anxiety, trigger anxiety. Get them to think, oh, hey, my competitors are doing this, or I wasn't aware of this new regulatory change. Maybe I need to look at this a little bit closer. Then demonstrate the influence that you have through references and case studies and motivate them to make the change to address the problems or the challenges that you've highlighted. It doesn't all have to happen in email. It doesn't all have to happen on the phone. It works best when it is strategically choreographed across these channels. And so another way of looking at this is thinking about when you interact and when you're going to reach out, what you're trying to do with each interaction. We have a tendency to see a lot of people that do prospecting think, okay, hey, I'm going to call them today. I'm going to send them an email tomorrow. Maybe I'll call them again. Maybe I'll leave a voicemail. They think about these as silos when what we really need to think about this is kind of a river, right? Everything is connected. So if I'm going to do a couple of social interactions and share a report, then in my next email, I'm going to say, hey, I shared this report. I'm going to share it again. Oh, here's the link. Share this report on the social interaction. And as I thought about it, I wanted to bring up X, Y, and Z think there's a reason for us to have a conversation. Then maybe on your next call, you leave a voicemail and you say, hey, I, I sent you an email with that report based on having interacted with you socially before. Now I wanna make sure that we have an opportunity to talk. I'm gonna send you uh, an, an email. I'm gonna follow up with an email, to schedule some time. So we always wanna make sure that they're connected. We have a tendency to see these be broken and where it doesn't work, and please, if you listen to anything I say, don't send emails that say, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you and noticed you haven't responded to the last three emails. Number one, it's annoying. Number two, it is poor form. And yes, you're right. I didn't respond to you because you didn't say anything that I really cared about. We want to make sure that the connections are subtler than that, right? You can call them out, but they need to be based on that value. Not just like, hey, I'm sitting here in the basement all alone and you're not responding to me and I feel bad right? This is about them. This is about the value we can provide to them. So we want to connect each of these interactions. When you think about developing cadences, they usually will have 15 to 17 touches. So a touch can be email, social interaction, voicemail. Each time you try and call, send them a snail mail. Like when you construct these like blocks, right? We want to make sure we're thinking about each of these things but 15 to 17 touches across 20 to 24 business days is really what we're after. Now, when you think about doing, instead of like mass markets, like, hey, I'm going after all of manufacturing, you could run one cadence, again, all, against all the VPs of marketing or all of the CTOs and manufacturing companies uh, to your heart, you know, to your heart's content. For those of you that are doing account-based sales, you're going to be given a list of accounts in manufacturing. So you're going to have to go after multiple individuals in the organization. We don't want to run the same cadence against the same individuals inside of an organization because eventually they're going to talk and they're going to notice that all of that goodwill you brought, you, you garnered by making them think you were paying attention to them, all of a sudden goes out the window because they're like, oh, hey, look, Chad sent me the same email too. What we want to do in that case is develop the cadences 
so that they are varied inside of an organization. And yes, I do have, I do have cadences that are called hair metal, Batman's back and Dr. Seuss. Um, this probably tells you more about me than you wanted to know. However, they help me understand what I'm trying to do, right? So Batman's back. It's a very boomerang-like cadence. I'm going to keep cycling through the same information because I know the role I'm going after needs that repetition, right? They need to see the same information a couple of times. Maybe I'll send the same report three times, but highlight different sections of it. Right? We want to make sure that they are varied and that we're not sharing the exact same information or value at the exact same time with the exact same person. If you can construct them, if you can make sure that you get into the mindset, that you make sure your perspective focused on them is the most critical. If you can make sure that you are asking important questions, well-informed questions from their perspective, and you can do this consistently through time blocking, make sure that the people you're going after, the data is accurate. You can do those elements and multi-layer your cadences. You will generate the results that we see time and time again. So the question I'm often asked is, does this work? So some of you have probably seen this infographic. This is based off of working with a couple of companies over the last year. There was another infographic I'm sure we can attach in the on-demand uh, that showed what happened when we ran some comparative cases. But this is real world working with digital marketing company and a CX platform provider. In class with customer A, we saw them set a fourfold increase in C-level executive meetings using this approach. That was in the training. That wasn't what they were able to do six weeks later. We also, in that class, were able to generate a million dollars in pipeline by using these approaches. Now, with a customer who gave us data four weeks out, they're increasing the number of dials by 33% an hour. The more dials you make, the better chances for connection, the more practice you get at handling objections, the, that it becomes the break point where we most often see cadences break. If I've fed you three or four emails, a couple of social interactions and a voicemail, I call you, you're gonna pick up the phone, you're gonna remember all of that, but I still have to do the dials. The same customer was able to be quoted by 13%, right? After we sat down and worked with them and went through this process all the way. It isn't, there's no silver bullet. I wish I could say to you guys, hey, here's how you're going to beat your quota every time. But that's the beauty of sales, in my opinion. It's the absolute beauty of sales. It's a discipline. It requires multifaceted best practices. What are the best practices in email today or in handling objections or picking up the phone? But at the end of the day, we all know the things we have to do. Where it gets really interesting, where it gets fun, quite frankly for me, is really strategically choreographing those outreaches to increase my response rates, to break my cadences, to make them as effective as possible so that I'm constantly going to President's Club or I'm constantly blowing out my number or I can go buy another Harley in my case. Some people may want sports cars or motorcycles. So end of the day, it does work. We've got the data to prove it. We all know what we need to be doing. The tools in the Vortex framework are designed to help support you as you go through that process. Value Selling has a lot of resources to help support you as you go on your prospecting journey as well. And so with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Let me open the chat here. Questions. Can we get the recording? Yes, that'll be an on-demand. Other questions? Different methodologies. Different methodologies have different styles for phone outreach. Okay, can you speak to how you approach the first 30 seconds when you get a prospect on the phone? Sure, So, the, um, and I apologize, I can't see the name of who asked, but that was a question that came in. So let's think about reaching out Somebody picks up the phone. What's the initial reaction? And first and foremost, if you guys are in this business and you're not answering cold calls, you're doing yourself a disservice because nothing will make you feel better about picking up the phone than listening to other people attempt to do it well. Now, it takes practice to get good. And so when we think about that first initial connection, they pick up the phone, hello, right? Now, nine times out of 10, they probably think you were the dentist calling. They weren't expecting it to be you, right? It's an interruption and we need to understand that. We've interrupted somebody, their initial reaction. It's not gonna be personal. It's not gonna be about us. It's gonna be them trying to go, crap, I got other things to do. I wanna get off this phone call. 
So one of the things we talk about, we talk about a couple of things. One of the first things I do is I repeat their name. So if I'm calling, say, Chris, and Chris answers, I say, Chris, because saying somebody's name grabs their attention instantly. You ever notice if you're in a crowded room, somebody whispers your name across the room, you may not hear anything else, but you may hear your name. So I'll repeat their name. I will state who I am, where I'm from, and what I want as quickly and concisely as possible. My name is Chad. I'm with Value Selling. I'd like to spend 15 minutes talking to you about how we've helped other customers like you achieve X, Y, and Z. And stop. The first 30 seconds is a long time on a cold call, and that's what the question specifically asks. Really, it's about the first 15, 10 to 15. You want to state who you are, where you're from, because chances are they're not going to remember it and get to the ask. We use neuro-linguistic programming techniques like pace, pace, lead. So two undeniable truths followed by your ask. Or we use a pattern interrupt, something, ask them something they weren't expecting. But it is all about, and no matter what technique you use, it all boils down to how confident you are, is your professionalism coming through, and are you being respectful of their time and realizing it truly is an interruption? So those, that would be my quick answer to that one. Um, happy to talk more about that. Uh, let's see, can you go back and explain your cadence in more detail? I can go, I can, let me go back, whoops. Let me go back a couple slides. So let's use, let's use this one. Uh, this is from Sean. So Sean, hopefully you're still on and this is what you're looking for. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in this instance, and this is only a portion of a cadence. Remember, 15 to 17 touches is what we're after, okay? This particular example was for marketing executives um, when we put it together. And so what I'm gonna do is let's say I'm going, I'm gonna use the name Chris again, just because she's a coworker and I know she's listening. So if I'm gonna go after Chris and Chris is a CMO for a company and she's active, she's CMO, so chances are she, she is or one of her direct reports is active on social media. I'm gonna take a share that she put out there. Maybe it's a new report that came out that they worked on. I'm gonna give that report a quick scan I'm gonna find a point in it that resonates with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna then interact and engage on social media. I'm not just gonna like something. I'm actually gonna say, hey, really enjoyed this element of this report. And then I'm gonna share something. If you liked this report, you may also like this one. And here's the link. That's my social interaction number one. Then maybe two days later, and you never want your touches to be more than five business days apart. If you get further than five business days apart, you have a tendency to lose that priming effect. You get to the second social interaction. The second social interaction, like, hey, I shared that. Two days ago, I shared this report with you, and I thought you might also find this interesting. Maybe my first social interaction is in something they shared, and my second quote unquote social interaction is I sent them a, an in mail that says, hey, remember when I shared you this report? Here's something else I thought you might find interesting. Would love to get 15 minutes if it's possible to get your thoughts. Then, maybe two, three days later, I'm going to send an email. And I'm gonna say, hey, we have other customers that are dealing with the same things that showed up in that report I shared uh, via social media. I think we should spend 15 minutes to talk about how we can help you address those same problems. And then I'm gonna daisy chain that through. So by the time I get down here to voicemail, my voicemail, I never expect anybody to call me back. Some people do, but I never ever <laughs> expect them to. Voicemail should be 15 to 18 seconds long. Who I am who I'm with and what I'm gonna do. Not necessarily what I want, like, hey, call me back. But hey, Chris, this is Chad with Value Selling. I sent you a report two days ago via email I think is important for us to talk about. I'm gonna send an email to see if we can find some time. Keep an eye out for it. Click. Some people will tell you to put your phone number in. Guess what? Everybody has caller ID. I, I, you can try it. It's really gonna be what works best for you. I have a tendency not to do that. I wanna keep it within the 15 to 18 seconds uh, when I do the voicemail. Hopefully that um, <laughs> hopefully that helps. Julie Thomas, you're so cute. What kind of Harley do I ride? Uh, I have a 2016 CVO Street Glide Harley, uh, black on black on black. Okay, so do you actually, do I create a PowerPoint for organizing your cadence? Um, this is from Robin. Uh, great question, Robin. So no, <laughs> I am not, I, I do not live and breathe in PowerPoint. Um, you guys get the benefit of it for the webinar, but that's about it. Um, I use, when if there's not a tool in the tech stack that allows us to easily um, manage the cadences or create them, 
I use Excel. It's it's very simple. We have a cadence tracker uh, that we can that we probably can provide with you on demand. I'll have to get approval from the boss on that one. But it's simply a, an Excel spreadsheet that allows you to put the list of people at the bottom you're going to contact. So name, title, email, phone number, and then at the top you create your cadences. And I say, okay, I'm going to use this. I'm going to do email one on this day. I'm going to send a, do a call on this day. Excel is the easiest point. It's also easier for me personally to go in and then just color code it. I sent out these things and my cadence broke on the third email, meaning I got a response or I now have a meeting scheduled. So for me, um, maybe it's a little old school, a Google Doc or a Google Sheet or Excel uh, is the easiest way uh, that I've found to manage those kind of going forward. Do you have examples on what to say in all of your cadences, email one, email two? Can you show how it works? from beginning to end. So I think I kind of talked about how they daisy chain together. Um, I'd be happy to set up time. This question was from Aurora. Happy to set up some time to walk you through in much more detail. Here's how it works. It's hard to do with, with a big audience on a webinar. Examples of what to say or how to do. We can talk about that till we're blue in the face. First and, first and foremost, we want to do it. You know, it always comes down to, hey, what's the best time of day for me to call? That question tells me that you're really just looking for a reason not to call. So we got to do the call blocks. We got to do the emails. Shorter, sweet. We've got some templates that we go over in class and some techniques that we use. Um, I'm happy to check with headquarters and see if we might be able to provide some of those. Uh, Aurora, let's see. <laughs> Best tips for calling warm leads. So this is from Stacy. How to craft what I say. So warm, I'm going to say warm. When, definition of warm is a little different. So maybe it's a referral. Maybe it is, um, maybe it's a little bit warmer MQL. Maybe an SDR pre-qualled it for you and sends it over. Anytime you get on the phone or anytime you craft an email and you don't have a real personal relationship yet, the best advice, state who you are, who you're with and what you want. And the reason we want it to be as concise as possible is because it shows respect. Nobody reads really long emails. You know, we say we want it all to fit on a mobile screen these days. So short, sweet, and to the point. It shows respect for their time. It also, and this is where the crafting your questions should include at least one question that we're hoping they will respond to. And it needs to be a well-informed and well-crafted question, something that comes from our research, something that we know from working with other clients like them has been a topic of conversation. I don't, um, I believe in scripting stuff out and practicing it until I can make it my own. Unless when you're looking at a script, you make it sound rote, then that doesn't, that doesn't work, right? Authenticity is key. Authenticity in the way you write, authenticity in the way that you speak when you're on the phone is key. Um, that is really a personal thing. We can give you kind of a form or a framework for it, some points. Uh, and those examples, I believe, are going to be on the website or I'll make sure that they're out there with the on demand. All right. <laughs> All right. So this is from Stacy. What are some of your favorite publications or sites to gather industry news? Um, so here's a, here's a great little hack. If I'm going after an industry, say manufacturing, since I've been using an example, I'm going to Google search manufacturing emerging trends or manufacturing analyst perspectives or manufacturing latest news. Those are the three that I go to all the time. T somewhere in the top 10 shares, you'll find a report, you'll find an analyst perspective, you'll find a piece of content that comes from someplace else, a third party that, that is going to provide you an overview so you can really inform and construct those questions. But it's also going to allow, provide you something you can share. Uh, in value selling parlance, we call that the sphere of influence. So sphere of influence, and I apologize, I'm not gonna back all the way up to the front of the presentation, but sphere of influence is everything that's out there in the market that your company provides or is, is you know, marketing assets uh, financial statements, if they're public, um, news and events, but also other things that are written by third parties. And we want to make sure that we understand not only what our company is doing and what assets are at our fingertips, but we want to run those types of really quick searches. And we block, I block this time out to 15, 30 minutes. On, I'll do two industries and I'll pull three or four reports, store the links in I use, again, Google Sheets or, or Excel, store them, and then I have them at my fingertips. And then when I start to do my email personalization or start to do my outreach, I'll go pick a couple of, of really relevant points. But those generalized searches work. 
you always want to look for almost every industry will have a trade uh, association associated with it. Uh, for example, value selling, since we're in sales enablement, training magazine, training industry, they always put out a lot of great stuff. It's true of almost any industry, but those three searches are the ones that I would I would use uh, the most. Another vote for the cadence tracker, okay. Do you use anxiety questions in your emails? This is obviously somebody who's been through the training. Um, so Chris, anxiety questions. Yes, we can use them, but it is not something that I would do in my first two touches. So let's assume that your cadence has a social interaction followed by two emails. I use an anxiety question three to four touches into a cadence if I haven't gotten a response. Um, anxiety questions can go multiple different ways. If we don't know the person, we don't know how they might respond to an anxiety question. And so it introduces a little bit of risk, which is why I always want to start a cadence with as much value up front as possible. I don't want to try and trip that anxiety trigger too fast. Um, I will use them in email. Uh, I prefer to use initially questions that aren't as anxiety inducing, but are still well-informed questions uh, as we engage as we engage early in the cadence. Let's see. Okay, that's a really long one. Here's another one. So cadence, 15 touches depends on buyer persona. Okay, yeah, this is great. So this is from Allie, and this is about, hey, wait, you just said touch somebody 15 to 17 times in 20 to 24 business days. Yes, um, I understand the concern that this brings up. Some people instantly start to think, well, am I gonna get restraining orders? Um, but think about it in the context of the individuals that you're reaching out to. Like I said, I get 100 emails. I don't know how many LinkedIn notifications. Yes, I'm old, so I'm still on Facebook. I get some Facebook notifications. I said new cat video comes in. We're constantly being bombarded with on the digital landscape today. So while it may seem excessive to us, 15 to 17 touches um, spread out over that time frame is not particularly invasive to an individual. Um, I have clients who have said, "Hey, I really appreciate the persistence and the spacing of the way you have reached out to me because it isn't like." Now, now, let me be clear. We don't want to call them 15 times in one day. We don't want to call them three times a day, five days in a row, right? The beauty of the multi-channel cadence approach is that those number of touches feel even less invasive than they might if they were all through one channel, but they're just as effective at priming the memory if, you, if your persona targeting is correct, right? If you know that that person's on social or that you can get an email topic or a subject line that's going to capture their attention. Um, things of that nature. So it isn't it isn't invasive at all. It doesn't feel invasive unless you have an executive who doesn't get a lot of email. And I don't know many that fall into that category. So I'm not worried about over. Um, I'm not worried about being invasive with the outreach if you space it right. Again, that's why spending the time to really think about your cadences, not just throwing something together. That's why it's important to really put the focus in when you're developing those cadences. Some of them may be front loaded. So across 15 days, maybe you do seven touches in the first four days, but you're across three different channels. So it may not feel as invasive. You're not the only person that's out there trying to get their attention. They've got other things coming in and things they have to deal with. So it doesn't get um, invasive unless you pile it all into one day. And then that's just, let's be honest, kind of creepy. All right, so I'm going to, Come down here. I'm going to remind you guys the end of today webinar. You can download this on our website, valueselling.com. I know there are more questions, and I apologize I didn't get to all of them. Um, we will collect them all. I will respond to each of you personally if you've asked a question that I haven't responded to. Um, so, but you can get today's slides on our valueselling.com website under the webinars uh, tab. Also, keep a heads up for the next one, October 18th. We're doing From the Front Lines B2B Prospecting Challenges. It's based off a report value selling worked on with some other industry leaders. Again, don't forget to follow us. And do me a favor, connect with me on LinkedIn, reach out, check out our podcast. Um, a lot of the answers uh, that you have questions that answers to the questions you have asked, you can actually hear me ask some of those same questions to other executives and hear their perspectives and how they want to be reached out to. So I want to thank everybody for the time. You'll see the slides. And until next time, wishing nothing but the greatest success.